Hey, mental workers. Welcome back to the Mental Work Podcast for Early Career Psychologists. Today, I'm very excited because we have an interesting topic where we are talking about cultural competence and the intersection between that and what we do in the therapy room. What prompted me to think of this topic was witnessing the Black Lives Matter movement. This is a few years ago now and wondering about its implications for early career psychologists. Not only that, but during my university training, which was only five years ago, I did not receive any explicit instruction in how to work with culturally and linguistically diverse populations. There was an assignment where we had to write about a different population, how we would work with them. And because I didn't have any instruction in cold populations, I did mine on them. And I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to work with these people? They are, of course, in our community. They are our community. And so I'm really excited today to have Dr. Avril Cook on. She's a clinical psychologist and wears many other hats, and she's going to be sharing her personal and professional insights into this area, as well as practical takeaways. Hello, Avril. Hello, Bronwyn. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Pleasure. And could you just tell the listeners a bit about you so we can have a bit of your background? Yes, yes. So I'm a clinical psychologist in my training background, but um, as you mentioned, I've worn a number of different hats, which I rely on frequently. Um, I've spent, a, you know, more than a decade in in New South Wales health, working in tertiary settings in specialised uh, specialised clinical fields such as gender and um, eating disorders and um, FND somatoform conditions. But then I've also spent a bit of time in academia as well and have supervised a lot of clean sites and have run and developed uh, psychology training programs in my role leading training programs at, at ACAP. I stay involved with some of the academia and the training um, around training up psychologists with a few of my projects with different universities. But now I spend most of my time um, in private practice and running my own clinic and consultancy. And that's where I've been able to expand a little more and do do some more interesting work with organizations, um, psychology organizations, but also non-psychology organizations around decolonizing their organizations, their practices, and their clinical practices. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and I guess today we're focusing on the decolonizing psychology practices. And I'm really interested to know, how do you connect to this area and how did you get into yeah. it? Yeah, look... I think that it was something that always uh, bothered me. You, you mentioned right at the start that you didn't receive any training in your in 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 your course, and that is exactly the same story as mine. And and for most of us, we did not receive training mm. in this area. And I recall when I was doing my my doctorate that um, <clears throat> I think we got one lecture tagged onto the end of some subject delivered, you know, in in an hour or two about working with Indigenous people or being culturally competent. And I thought, oh, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit so well. Like this, this is our community and we have a very multicultural community. Yeah. Um, I myself have very mixed racial heritage. I, I'm half Chinese. There is um, exploration I'm doing into my own Indigenous family history. And the experience I had of being in psychology was one where I but I've had to pretend that that didn't exist and I had oh. to really, um, I think, uh, was encouraged to embody sort of an archetype of what a psychologist was, which in hindsight was very much a white, middle-class, educated person who was very conservative. And there wasn't a lot of encouragement about how to, how to utilise our unique experiences, particularly around cultural understanding, into our therapeutic work. As I moved through, as I moved through the profession and became more able to be involved in, um, in sort of working parties around in, including different cultural groups and working with different populations, I had a lot of opportunity. Um, I used to run an ICAM service out in the southwest of Sydney and worked a lot with Aboriginal mental health workers and was able to really kind of get stuck into how we can actually connect with community and hear voices so that we're bringing appropriate treatment to different communities. So when I moved into training, um, I very much brought that ethos with me. It's, where is this? It is missing. It is it is very anglicised. It is very um, narrow in the perspective. And we need to broaden our perspectives on skills, but also in how we work with how we work with different communities. So we're actually servicing Australian people. 
Yeah. So it sounds like a twofold thing. It sounds like when you were starting off in becoming a psychologist, you noticed there was a complete absence of mm. cultural competence information aside from that tag or not the end of a lecture. <laughs> and that already right. felt inadequate to you. Yeah. And then it sounds like your identity as a, as a mixed race person yourself. Mm. Mm. And I don't know, what was that experience like for you to kind of have this feeling that you needed to be this white middle-class kind of person? Yeah. Look, I think at the time I didn't recognize that 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 is what was happening because when we're training, we're we're often like, okay, well, what do we need to be? We're trying Mm -hmm. to emulate what we're told to be and we emulate this thing. And it's probably been um, only with me growing older and me doing my own personal reflections and the people I connect with and the conversations that I've had that I've kind of gone, oh, maybe this is not quite what it should be. Also, the political movements happening around me has really caused me to think, you you know, Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, more recently, you know, the Queen's passing, all of these things Mm. have made me think and reflect on my own personal story and realise that they were very disconnected from one another, myself as a person and culturally and my history and that of me in the profession. And Mm. I needed to do some integration. And you said, what was it like as an experience? It was very lonely because... I didn't have anyone to look to to help me to do this. And I've sort of had to figure this out a lot on my own. And in doing that, I've met others who have been on this journey with me who have helped me enormously through sharing their experiences of a similar, you know, journey that they've had to make. So I I guess what I bring, I bring a lot of passion to this because I think it is something that we all need to work with, regardless if we come from the dominant culture or not, because we live in a multicultural Australia and psychology is, is it needs to acknowledge that. And it really hasn't to date. Yes. And it really sounds like when you came into contact with that service, you mentioned that you had an Aboriginal service that you yeah, were yeah. working in. It sounds like yeah. when you were working there, it was immediately obvious to you about the lack of, I guess, perhaps experience and training that you had in that area, or perhaps the service yeah. you were delivering to them didn't Absolutely. quite meet their needs. Absolutely. And I, I think I probably reflected on um, the casual racism that I had experienced uh, to date and, and kind of at the time just was jarred by that experience. But with distance, I was able to identify this has come from a place of not knowing and a place of ignorance. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to work harder at fixing this. Like it's just not acceptable that um, we have these services that are not, not catering to our communities. Yeah, it sounds absurd when you think of yeah. other 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 people and other populations. Let's say we had yeah. a client with an eating disorder and we're giving them, I guess, a therapy that wouldn't meet their needs and not actually That's helping right. them to recover or achieve their goals. Right. It would sound yeah. absurd to us, right? But yeah. it sounds like when we come into contact with people from different cultures, we're like, no, nah, one size fits all. It's all good. That's right. It's like it, it's sort of a, a blame that's maybe put back on communities was they don't access our service. So we don't mm-hmm. actually see them. We don't have to deal with different cultural groups. Or if that if we do deal with different cultural groups, we do it with a very white um, Anglo-centric uh, lens. Mm. So it doesn't fit. And that sounds like where your passion lies. It is mm. that right? So it's really yeah. making sure that we get the services but also I guess the right approach to assisting people from culturally diverse backgrounds. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I think wherever I've been, it's about how do we actually expand our horizons? So if I've been in a clinical service, I want to be working with a local Aboriginal, um, you know, medical service. I want to, you know, have access to Aboriginal mental health workers. I want to have community connection. If I'm working in academia, I want to bring that into our curriculum development, um, into our teaching, into people who are coming into our classrooms, teaching um, the profession. I want there to be culturally and lingu- linguistically diverse psychologists. Yeah. Radical, like coming <laughs> in so we don't have to be, we don't have to be looking around at, um, you know, around at our peers saying where's the support and how do we think about things differently and hearing an echo chamber. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I think it's just, you know, now for me in my own practice, it's some, it's very much the ideal in the organisation that I run is that we are diverse and we bring mm. diversity and we share that through the structure of the organisation and the work that we do every day. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know too much about this and pulling this out of my head, but I have mm. heard mm. that more yeah. diverse workplaces and I guess more diverse professions results in better outcomes for everybody. Could you speak to that? I feel like yeah, that's very absolutely. broad, but it's just something that I've heard. 
Absolutely. No, you're you're correct. There is a there is a lot of research on this, and um, a lot of this research is ignored. Interestingly, <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I mean, uh, some of it uh, is centered around decision making and success of organisations, particularly around um, you know organisations' um, ability to weather storms like you know COVID, and um, also their financial viability. And they've found that when boards are diverse, and that means gender, it means culturally, racially kind mm. of different decision makers at the head of the helm, um, not just your white, male, older board member, you have a more robust organisation that can weather these things. There, there, there is also research done, interestingly, on when, we, when COVID hit and when there were female um, leaders in countries, they actually survived so much better. There were much better social policies. Um, the countries weathered those storms a lot better. So there is research in that in in those areas. Um, a massive yeah. gap between that and action. <laughs> yeah, because what I'm, what I'm, I feel convinced, what I'm essentially yeah. hearing is that cultural competence and embedding cultural knowledge and services into our profession to psychology would be beneficial for both us as a profession and for the people who we serve. That's right. That's right. And actually, I was just recalling as I was talking to you, you know, something was maybe in Psych 101 in my undergrad, and I don't know about, the, you know, how recent it is, but yeah. I do recall decision making and, you know, the research around decision making was very clear that if a leader stood up and said their viewpoints first, then everyone followed suit and a poor decision was made. Whereas if there was the leader that sat back and asked for an expected opinion, discussion, a better decision was was made because you don't just get a uniform consensus Mm. which is challenging I think and challenging for people who are used to being in power maybe that does link us to the therapy room then because perhaps there's this western notion that we're the experts so kind of white savior thing coming in I'll tell you what to do I know how to heal you rather than actually taking a step back and listening to the clients who are in front of us and the people and humans who we work with um, maybe you could speak to kind of how cultural competence intersects with like the therapy room like does that does that concept gel with you absolutely I think that's um that's an area I'm really excited by. I, I know that from my work in the field that it, it seems to be a big gap for those of us who are clinicians, um, those of us who work in the therapy space. It's a very sort of, it's a very, um, it, I guess a lot of the work that is done is centered around as a society, like how as humans or members of society, can we be more open and learn how to be an ally um, there is some, some amazing work being done by psychologists in the field who come from who are indigenous, who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds that talk, that do research and talk about what's important. But I think where I can where I can kind of see myself fitting in is like how does how do we translate this into the therapy room? Yeah. Why should we care about this? What is this? How does this affect me as a therapist and my work with my client and my client's experience, um, as well as their mental health come, their health outcomes ultimately. So look, when I when I'm working with clinicians, and it might be early career clinicians, people in training, or very experienced clinicians that are wanting to work on improving their cultural competence, I think the the thing I first start with is why this is important mm. and why should we care about this. And I do get people to do um, some exercises. So there's some a few great quizzes out there, which is really helpful. Oh, cool! Uh, that you can jump on. I'll just. I'll just mention them. They're, they're not like, um, one of them is not a scientific one, but it's a really great one. It's just checking your degree of privilege. Oh, it's I love actually it. just like a BuzzFeed. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it even more. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really good because it, like you, it takes a bit of time to answer the question, but it comes back with a, this is how privileged you are, like percentage yeah. wise. Um, and I encourage people to do that because I think many of us who are in higher education have gotten there because we have a great deal of privilege. Despite what challenges we have gone through, we've gotten into higher education. Yes. Mm. So it can be easy to forget that that means we've we've experienced a lot of privilege in our life and a lot of good fortune to be able to be in that position. So to kind of do that and go, oh, wow, okay, actually this this is what I come with and maybe these are the things that have been challenges for me, but let's think about that in relation to our entire society, maybe people who have not got that degree of privilege who have not been able to have that fortunate um, pathway. And there's another also great link as well to a scientific study, 
where it tests um, our implicit um, biases in a number of domains. So, you know, fat phobia, um, mm. gender, racism, all of these sorts of things. And that's also really good too because it reminds us all that we're all we all do have implicit racism. Really, like we've 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 got to be straight here. I do. I, I yes. you know I have a culturally diverse background, but this is in the air that we breathe. It's the society we live in. You're going to have it, and that's part of part of working on it is accepting. You've got it. I've got it. How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to work on this? I really love that, and I will share those links with the listeners. So, listeners, I'll put them in the show notes. It's absolutely, it makes a lot of sense to me because my immediate reaction when I think of cultural competence is I think, oh, I have a lot of anxiety around this. I want to make sure I say the right things and I really want to do the right things. But I think it's really important having heard what you just said to come back to that understanding and acceptance of our own privilege and biases that we hold. Because I remember even, this is way back in undergrad, but I remember during social psychology, there's a bias towards our own uh, faces of our own race yeah, and we find it more absolutely. difficult to distinguish faces from different races that's so right. even that kind of bias that we have it's really important yeah. to acknowledge that yeah that's right and I think if we can take away the guilt from that because I think sometimes people feel a lot of guilt and then they either want to deny that they have these beliefs or perceptions and, or they feel really shameful about it and then don't know how to respond I think we just have to accept like this is kind of a lot of it is hardwired in us the mm. the the I guess the tendency to create in groups and out groups, but that doesn't mean that's how we have to choose to behave. And we yes. need to be really mindful of how we respond to that. And I guess, you know, if I, if I can share what I do personally mm. is I just have that radar on. And if I have a reaction, I examine my reaction. I go, oh, <laughs> I wasn't aware that that was there. Um, I need to think about that. And I need to think about how I want to behave in regards to this particular issue. So I guess like in the therapy room, it would be like noticing that you might have an assumption about somebody else or noticing an emotional reaction, stopping and pausing and being like, oh, that just happened. I wonder what was that was about? Yes. Yes. I I mean, I think honestly, it's got to happen. It's got to happen outside of the therapy room. Yeah. Um, It's got to happen on a day to day basis that you're Mm. making a commitment to learning. You're going to observe and reflect your own reactions, your own biases, read, read about and learn about from other people who have thought about these sorts of things and reflect how you feel Mm. about what you're reading. And then, of course, in the therapy room, even before we head into the therapy room, what are we, what responses are we having when we see a particular name? Maybe Mm. it indicates something, you know, that you, you have a different response to a, you know, Anglo name versus, you know, another cultural name. Reflect on it. Find supervision, find supervision with someone who knows about this stuff and can talk with you about race and talk with you about culture. That's a really good point. And it really just, it, I'm smiling right now because literally I have never talked about that with a supervisor before. And of course, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm yeah. just like, oh crap, I've never oh. actually done that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and sounds it's not like a great idea. Yeah. So we've talked about, I guess, acknowledging and accepting that we will have biases and then noticing our reactions. What would be Mm. the next step for, I guess, early career psychologists who really want to do well by their clients and embed this cultural and linguistic diversity into their practice? Yeah. Look, I would suggest there's a great resource, again, that um, Amnesty International has put out about being an ally. And I think it's a great starting point. It, It talks a little bit about sort of like, the perspectives you might want to have, the approaches you might want to have in, in I guess, examining your own beliefs and your own um, understanding about what it is to be an ally, what it is to be um, culturally aware. Mm. Um, and I, I, you can think, I can send you that link as well. And then I think the next thing is like having a look at the the area that you work in and that you practice in. So it might be that uh, you live in a very Greek area. Um, maybe you need to go away and research Greek history uh, or, you know, culturally what it, is, what it means to be Greek. Is there a community that you service a lot that you do need to get upskilled in? Because there's many, many different cultures we may encounter. We're not necessarily going to be aware of all of them, but you can guarantee that a particular area will be servicing a particular tendency to have a particular type of person walk in the door. Um, it might be that you're dealing with trans people um, and gender issues, so you need to go away and upskill. When you say learn more and upskill, can we do that by doing a Google and finding more out about this culture? 
or are there other better yeah. ways or more recommended yeah. ways? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good idea. I mean, I would start with that. I would definitely start with doing a Google and seeing what you find. But I think I do unfortunately think that sometimes we have to resort to that because there's not there's not always a lot of information out there. But I would try and go to some reputable resources if you can. I know that the APS recently did a decolonizing um, workshop, um, which would be something you could sign up to. I don't know if they're running it again. I have a decolonizing workshop as well. Find people who do this work, learn about how to go about it. Find people in the community, you know, community organizations that that write about uh, write about this or look for writers who are critiquing our culture and how that intersects with our politics or our or our day-to-day beliefs about um, the world. I, mm. I know myself, I, I'm trying to learn more about disability because it's not something I know a great deal about. And so I follow a few people on Facebook and Instagram. And through that, I'm learning about different perspectives and I'm opening my eyes to different attitudes um, that I need to become more aware of. Okay. So when I hear that, it sounds like a key thing is making sure that you're not stuck in, I guess, an echo chamber, but yeah. rather really opening your perspective to new diverse voices. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yes. Sounds good. Can do that. <laughs> one thing I'm in- <laughs> one thing I'm interested in is when we encounter clients in the therapy space, I'm interested to know how much we need to disclose or share or acknowledge with clients in that space our own privilege or the fact that we might be from a different cultural background. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that's really important. It's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> Look, again, it's going to depend on your client, um, but I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you two examples. I actually had a client who approached me um, because she specifically wanted to work with a therapist from an Asian background. And in that instance, there were a lot of race factors. There were a lot of cultural understanding that that she required. In that scenario, I am absolutely going to be talking about my perspective, where I come from, how that may support um, the therapeutic relationship, but also that I'm not going to know everything. And, and there might be different perspectives and we all come from different um, different places culturally, despite maybe sharing a similar you know, Asian background. Now, it may not be important to every client that walks in the door. But I think if someone's identifying themselves in a particular way, it is respectful for us to perhaps share our, share our stance, our stance on that. So mm. if you've, if you've got someone who's come in with trans, um, who's trans or coming in with gender questioning, um, issues, it may be very important for you to say, look, I myself am a cis female and, you know, this is where I come from. I work a lot with people in this community. And then it's over to them to say, is that something I'm okay with? Do they mm-hmm. need someone that comes from the community? And is that really important to them? They need to be able to make that decision. So I guess we need to be able to provide enough information and allow our clients permission to either go with that or choose not to. So it sounds like the way that I would approach that then in my practice is always making sure that there is that base thing that clients know that they can decide whether or not they want to work with me and whether yeah. what I'm offering is okay with them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In a way, it's it, it falls under kind of like informed consent. In yeah. It's like, this yeah. is who I am. Are you okay to work with that? And it might be sometimes you say, look, I, I haven't worked with someone from a Muslim background. I'm really open and willing to explore that and learn more and learn. But if that's not okay with you, I also get that. Where do you sit? Mm. How do we move with this? Because someone might be like, no, we've got a great connection. And if you're open to hearing and not taking that top-down position, then yes, let's let's do this. Someone mm. else might, might not though. I agree because it might be that the person in front of us, perhaps if you've never worked with a person from a Muslim background before, they may feel like they have to educate you, the clinician, a Mm. lot and they might not be okay with that. So in terms of do's and don'ts, I have heard that a don't is don't make your client do the educative for you. Is that a general rule of thumb? Absolutely. It is absolutely a really important concept to remember and not just your client your friends, your peers, the person you meet on the street, don't expect them to educate you on what you are ignorant about. Yes. Mm. Um, And that's one of the big concepts I think that's important is, you know, understanding if you come from the dominant culture or even if you come from a place of privilege is that there is an expectation that other cultures will explain and do the work for you. 
And that yes. is a very entitled position. And so we have to be mindful of that and go away and do our work. Don't ask them to do it for us. Their load that they carry when they come from a minority or a, or a I guess, non-dominant group is having to explain themselves all the time or having to justify existence. So it's exhausting. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> good. Good um, to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's one thing that's running through my mind is I wondered if we could go through a hypothetical together because this is yeah. something I've counted in my practice, but we could go through it together and then see how a practitioner who is culturally competent and has that embedded in their practice might approach it. Is that yeah. okay with you? Yeah, that sounds great. It's, it's Hopefully it's a minor hypothetical, but tell me what you think yeah. of it. It might be that a client comes to you and they are of an Indigenous background mm-hmm. and then they say to you, I've encountered racism today. And the clinician is from a white background. And I wondered how a culturally competent clinician would approach that scenario. Obviously, it's very general, Mm. um, but I wondered if we could go through a few do's and don'ts for that kind of situation. Yes, fantastic. Well, I I would say part of the do's and don'ts start even before that conversation comes up with your client. As a starting point, you want to be asking your clients what cultural background they come from. Yeah. And you're wanting to have that conversation about whether how much that needs to be in the frame for your work. And you need to have that in the frame of your of your work with that client. So I um might start off by saying, you you mentioned here that you're indigenous. Can you tell me how, like what your connection is with your community? Um, Tell me a little bit about this. Do a bit of a cultural assessment with the client. They may have very little connection. That's important to know. Hmm. They may have a lot of connection. That's important to know. (laughs) So just like we would assess what is um, what is someone's social support like? What is their you know what is their family constellation? What's their employment like? We also need to find out about someone's cultural connection and um, how important that is to them. And so when they, you've done that background work and you've also had the conversation around, I'm doing learning in this area or I'm only starting my learning on this journey, I may make mistakes. Can we work with this? Please let me know if that, that happens. I'm working on this. Then when you have that conversation come up of I've experienced racism, you're not starting off from a cold. <laughs> um, yes. You know, you've, you've had the conversation already. Yeah. So then you have this scenario where where an Indigenous person said, I've experienced racism today. And I might simply explore it just like any other experience initially that someone has that's confronting or that we can expect to be confronting. I might simply ask them, tell me about what happened. What was that like for you? What does that bring up for you? And I think the the exploration, while it is similar um, to maybe any other difficult incident, we have to have a framework of what a person has carried before they've had that incident. Where are they coming from? What does this mean to them? And you might explore that, but you have to have the understanding that this is not just like, um, I, I've had a minor inconvenience today. This is this is probably a part of a very, very long series of many inconveniences, ma- um, many major incidences, many much history of violence done to your family, your people, your community and a real position of being unsafe in the world. So that changes how we approach these conversations, even though it may not always change the way we explore it. It, it, it can do. You probably hear some of the questions I'm saying might be similar to the questions you would ask anyway. Yeah. But to have that framework in the back of your mind is what is different. I'm, I'm learning a lot from speaking to you, Avril, and I'm sure the mm. listeners are as well, because the next question that comes to mind is, I was thinking, do I need to insert myself into this conversation, which is not something that I would actually consider perhaps the other circumstances that clients bring to me, but I mm. noticed that I have the urge to do that in this circumstance to actually be like, I haven't experienced racism as a white person. Mm. And mm. I'm just wondering, like, maybe that yeah. is something that is an automatic urge that I need to explore because yeah. maybe I don't actually need to insert myself into this conversation. Yeah, that's a really interesting reflection. And I think that's something that does come up um, when we haven't thought about these types of things very often is we get stressed and we go, oh, <laughs> this is this is me or, or yes, my friend experienced racism or I once experienced racism. And I think if we've done our work 
and we do all of that in the background, we don't feel that same urge to mm. insert oneself in, into the conversation because primarily this is not about you. Exactly. And yeah, and, and yeah. those urges are very natural and normal. We need to be doing that work behind the yeah, scenes. Totally. <laughs> not yeah. with our clients. Yeah. Yeah. And um and when we do that and when that happens, it is experience. I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but the experience often can be like, oh, wow, it's now about you again. Exactly. Or it's now about the white person who's feeling uncomfortable. When is it going to be about me and my experience? So a lot of it is really about the work we do behind the scenes so that we can actually be relationally appropriate in the therapy room and truly be there with our clients, for our clients, and be able to name these things and discuss these things without defensiveness, ignorance, and without doing harm. Wow, I've learned so much in that. So here's what I've learned is that <laughs> an encounter with a client who's had a racist experience, so we need to acknowledge that that is not perhaps an isolated incident, but it comes mm-hmm. from a history done not only to them, but to their family, their culture, their community. Yeah. And then the other thing that I've learned is that responding to it would be asking questions much the same of other experiences that clients have had, which are uh, perhaps uncomfortable or distressing to them. But Mm. if we address our anxieties and our own biases outside of the room, we can do Mm. that much better for them. That's right. Yes. yes. Awesome. That's it. Yeah. And I will say as part of that, um, I mean, it's just like working with any challenging scenario. Like if you've never dealt with I don't know, sexual assault, it can, if you're dealing with it in the room for the first time, you've never thought about how you might approach it. You might be in the room, your anxiety is in the room, like, oh shit, what do I do here? Um, So it's about doing the work behind the scenes Mm. so we're not bringing our own stresses and distress into the room. Can I, can I ask another follow-up question on that, which would be, let's say I say something that's stupid and offensive to the person sitting in front of me. Is yeah. the repair for a person from a different cultural background different to a person, say, who was experiencing, who had experienced sexual assault in front of us? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure that I can clearly answer that with a yes or a no. I, I guess it really depends on the client and, and what's happening in the room. But I think the important word you mentioned there was repair. What do you need to do to repair? And a true genuine repair means acknowledging what you've done wholly and fully without defensiveness, without excuses. And it is then an offering of doing better and having that opportunity to kind of you know fix things between yourself and another person. Um, so I think I guess I see it in terms of more conceptual ideas rather than literally words you might say. It's going to be different for everyone. Thank you. I really enjoyed going through that hypothetical. Is there anything else that you wanted to add that you think the early career psychologists listening need to know about the do's and don'ts in that situation? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think if you've done your work, it is also important for us as clinicians to be able to bring the frame of racism into the room. So I might have a lot of, I mean, I have a lot of uh, clients who come from non-dominant backgrounds. So when I say dominant, like not Caucasian backgrounds um, in Sydney, um, and it's going to be different wherever you are, but they come in and they say, "This, I'm depressed or I'm distressed or this is what's happening to me. I have a mental health problem. And I think part of my conversation with them is actually unpacking that, which is in a way, some of the harm that psychology can do is it put a label on this as a mental health problem. And a lot of what I see is it's not explicitly a mental health problem. This is actually, this is actually the experience of being harmed by a society in which, which you don't matter or you're not as important or you experience harm as a result of the way, um, way a group of people are treated. And, you know, just like I would, I, I know you had, um, uh, you had a guest on recently to speak around feminism. Just as we need to acknowledge that with our work with women, we need to acknowledge race, power structures and power dynamics and structural racism as part of the frame for what they might be presenting with. And you need to think about that. How does that impact on a person who presents with a a particular quote unquote mental health problem? Is it genuinely a mental health problem or is it just living in a place where you're treated badly? 
it feels revolutionary when I hear you say that because it really does flip the medical model on its head, right? <laughs> yes. When I was in training, it's like if I think of a standard CBT model, thoughts, feelings, behavior, and then the background mm-hmm. has, I guess, the, the cultural context, if anything, if you actually do that. And then yeah. it's just like a one minor, like, oh, like from a different cultural background, yeah. and then that's it for your formulation. This yeah. really instead flips that on and really considers like, power structures, uh, control, privilege, racism, culture as, as the dominant thing that we need to consider. Is that right? Yes, yes absolutely. And, I mean, the research the research very much backs this up. If you, if you do not belong to the dominant culture, you suffer from way more um, mental health issues. You suffer from way more um, bad things, essentially. Um, we know that of women, mental health outcomes for women versus men in certain power structures the outcomes are poorer, yeah. so they're more vulnerable. It is the same case for that. Uh, it's a primary concept in family systems work is who's the canary in the coal mine here that's signaling things are not okay in this system. Mm. It's not always about what you see right in front of you. With that, I guess bringing it back to the therapy space, actually it's not even a therapy space. It kind of is everything around it as well, and then yeah. we need to kind of bring that into the therapy space. Is that right? That's right. That's yeah. totally it, mm. yeah. How does that mesh with, I guess, the kind of medical model that is dominant? I mean, like in clinical mm. psychology, <laughs> it's all about diagnoses. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's tricky, isn't it? Because, yeah. I mean, we do the practicalities of, of life as a psych is that we do have to work within this and we live in this kind of society which does use a very medical model. And it can be challenging to meld those two because I, I think what I find is commonly the case is I'm translating all the time. I've got one language, which is the medical model. I have the Medicare clients. You know, we have to work within these structures. And at the other time, I have this enormous framework, which I know our structures don't necessarily gel with, but to me speaks very, uh, speaks a truth more so than the medical model. Yeah. And so I guess what I'm often finding is I, I formulate as I understand the client and I formulate with these bigger concepts and pictures in mind. And then what I'm having to do is distill that into language that fits within a medical model. So I may have someone referred under Medicare and yes, they meet all the symptoms. um, They meet all the criteria for depression, major depressive disorder. Great. We fulfilled that criteria for Medicare. We do all the forms, the questionnaires, the assessment around that. But then I'm going to bring into conversation something that I feel and that, you know, research shows us is actually healing. Mm. We can't just stop at, we can't just stop at checking your sleep, checking your, you know, regulating eating. And, you know, we can't stop there because there is a much deeper story um, that if we don't acknowledge, we're actually doing a disservice to our clients. And we're also kind of gaslighting them. Mm. If you just do better, if you just do all these things, your depression should go away. And if it doesn't go away, maybe you're just not working hard enough. <laughs> How awful. Wow, that's not sound terrible. But, I, I, but it might be what we're actually doing. And I guess that brings us back to the importance of having this cultural competence in that yeah. if we want to do a good job by our clients, by our community, then it sounds like we actually need, it is a need, it's not an option mm-hmm. to be culturally competent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I mean, I think that this is, I feel very passionate about this because it is something that psychology as a profession is slowly moving their gears towards kind of orienting this way, but it's so slow. Um, You know, we had the apology from the APS a number of years ago. We have had something which is really significant, which is adding cultural competence as a basic requirement for all psychologists. Yeah. the The gap now is where do we do this and how do we do this and who's there to teach us? Because we are a profession that I think is predominantly 70% white. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's not reflective of our community. No. Mm. Yeah, no, this is really good questions for the future. And and it is because, yeah, I've struggled to get training, but it makes me feel really good knowing that you're available now. And so, yes. of course, I will link listeners to your workshop in Amazing. the show notes. But previously, the only other people who I knew was Tracy Westerman. And then I looked at her yes. training and it was unaffordable for me. And I was like, well, that makes sense because she'd be amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it's had to be, I've attended some other kind of free days when I worked mm-hmm. at a hospital that did yep. cultural training. But yes. other than that, it's been for formal training options, yes. uh, limited, but yes. for informal training options, there are more diverse voices than ever who actually want us to be culturally competent. That's right. That's right. And I think um, 
I think what is really helpful is to make it something that is doable. We don't want to make it too overwhelming because this is not a, you don't arrive at a destination of I've achieved cultural competence, <laughs> done. This is an ongoing um, process of learning. And when I did my um, training recently on decolonizing therapeutic practices, I said, this hopefully, this training will be hopefully out of date, you know, soon. This is not, I'm hoping not to be doing this training again in a few years time because we're constantly evolving and learning Mm. and that needs to keep happening. And so that's maybe the way that you should approach it is grab these, grab these trainings where you can have listen to a podcast that's free do do a do a small training that costs a small amount of money um read newspaper articles read mm. articles around this read um read magazines there's, there's actually a an interview that I did with um a publication recently on decolonizing therapeutic practice and there's a lot of different voices around how therapy approaches might be i guess considered from different lenses so the information is out there we just need to make sure that we work and we actually go do it that's right. That's right. Yeah. And think and think and reflect. <laughs> okay. And think and reflect. Okay. I could do that. And I'm sure that yeah, listeners yeah. could do that too. I've learned so much from speaking with you and I just wanted to make sure that we've covered everything that you wanted to share with listeners. Mm-hmm. Was there anything else that we've missed that you haven't given a voice to? I suppose the, the I know that we're, we're, when talking to you is in your early career practice, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, an important thing to keep in mind is that this problem exists outside of just the therapy room and you'll be working in organizations which are set up to create systemic injustice and as you move through your profession I'm hoping you will see that more and more and I'm hoping that if you start this journey now as you move through your career and you move into positions of power and influence that if you have that lens you're then having the opportunity to question these systems and create new systems and that's how we create change. Mm, I hope so too. I hope we can create change in this area because one of the things that I've learned most of all is I already knew it was important, but I feel from speaking to you, I've really come away with that. It's essential. Yeah, I'm glad. That's that's exactly what I would love listeners to walk away with. Awesome. <laughs> is there anything else that you would love listeners to walk away with from our discussion today? Oh, I think just start start the journey. Yeah. Be, learn, try, make mistakes. It's okay. Ah, that's really nice to hear as well. (laughs) Because I feel like I usually say on this podcast that if I'm feeling it, I know that a listener is feeling it too. And I think an emotion that I identified through this is fear, fear of doing the wrong thing. I feel scared. But having talked with you, I'm like, no, I just need to dive in. Like, don't be scared. Just just learn, just reflect, keep it going and make it part of you. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's it. Great. (laughs) Well, Avril, if listeners want to learn more about you or get in touch, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can reach me. I, I have Instagram, I have Facebook, I have a website. Uh, my my company is um, Bodhi and Psychology, B O D H I and Psychology. Um, that's my handle, and website is www.bodhiandpsychology.com.au. And on that site, you'll also see links to training that I run um, on decolonizing your practice, but also on Facebook and Instagram, just different trainings that I'm running. You can get in touch with me there. Awesome. And I will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Avril, for coming on. I think this has been massively important discussion and super helpful. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been so fun to talk to you. And um, I'm really excited that there's a whole bunch of people potentially wanting to take this on in their practice. Yes. And listeners, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening and catch you next time.